Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Bill Cruzy. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us for our webinar series. Today's topic is going to be QBI deduction. Just some quick um, house, housekeeping. If you look at your Zoom screen, if you are joining us uh, and seeing video, then there is a place to send questions. It's normally in the more area where you can chat with people. Um, and if you highlight that, just be advised, you can chat with the panelists or with anybody else um, that's on the, uh, that's watching the video at the same time. So as we go through this, if you have questions, please um, send, a, send a chat to the panelists and Catherine, who is also on the line with us, she'll make sure that um, we get those questions answered as we go through. Got um, probably about 30 minutes worth of slides, maybe a little less, um, so plenty of room to ask questions. Make sure you don't you don't uh, miss any questions you want to ask. Obviously, any question is important, especially QBI and the QBI deduction is fairly new. That's the first thing to know. The second thing is pretty complicated. Um, when I'm putting together the slides, the variations of how to how to calculate QBI and the impact of QBI of different aspects of your business are critical. So if part of this is, hey, am I in the right business entity? then you know you may need to do some fine tuning on this please don't hesitate to call us afterwards um, we can certainly help you fine tune anything that's going on with your business or with something that's coming up um, that we may not be a know of yet so with no further ado i'm going to go ahead and get started here once again welcome to um, our qbi webinar on uh, qbi deduction so this is bill cruzy here we go um, this is our agenda, what is QBI? What is a QBI calculation? And how does the entity choice impact the QBI? And then finally, we're gonna wrap up. So that's our agenda for today. So we're gonna start at the top with what is QBI? QBI came from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2018. And really, most people don't realize it, but there are actually three different QBIs that were created with that. Um, one is specifically for agricultural and horticultural co-ops. So they have their own calculation. Another one is the one most of us are already aware of, which is the standard 20% of business pass-through gets me my QBI. One of the misnomers also is the third one is that you can also get a qualified, um, a QBI for a qualified REIT or publicly traded partnership. Now they have their own separate rules, but at the end of the day, if I am the taxpayer, first of all, the QBI is, is um, computed on my personal tax return because of the, imitation, the limitations for taxable income. But at the end of the day, if I own some of a qualified REIT and I own some of a publicly traded company partnership and I own a small business pass-through, what will happen is I'll be adding up the potential QBI from each one of those. Uh, it's a fairly complex scenario. It's kind of more of algebraic than just mathematical. So it's a little bit beyond the scope of this conversation, whereas this is just an introduction. So just, but be aware of that as you think about your investment portfolio. We do have farmers who have, who have co-op uh, ownership, you know, and so they're getting some dividends from that. How does that play in there? Or maybe I've invested in a PTP. How is that playing in there? So just, just be advised, um, as long as QBI is around, you have uh, more than just, I have a pass-through. You've got other elements. The next thing we want to talk about is, hey, provisions expire. 2025, uh, with the climate right now in Washington and across the country, um, it's probably unlikely that it survives past 2025. It may get phased out sooner. Um, and the things to think about here are is, first and foremost, is this QBI tax deduction does not impact my basis calculation. This is a permanent difference. And so it doesn't mean that if I'm suddenly getting QBI that I'm now negative in my partnership or S corporation basis. Doesn't mean that at all. So there's gonna be zero recapture for capital gains. It's gonna impact your basis calculations zero. So that's very important. Once again, it is a permanent difference, which means I'm not recapturing it if I suddenly sell this entity or my investment in that entity. There is no recapture. Um, and then finally, the deduction is not impacted by our existing individual carryovers. Many things like section 179 that's coming through from my pass-through entity S Corp or partnership could get hung up on my 1040 if I don't have the outside basis calculated right. This does not. This is calculated without regard to basis whatsoever. 
So those are pretty important elements of QBI. One of the most important for me is all that sums up and says, it's a freebie, folks. Um, I either get it or I don't. It doesn't carry forward. So planning could be important to make sure that if I'm looking at my horizon of 2025, then what am I doing that I could, so that I can maximize this free tax deduction between now and its expiration? That's part of what we're doing today. So what else? What is QBI? This is straight off the IRS newsroom. It's a fairly lengthy description, but basically most of us in the business are going to go, QBI at the end of the day is probably very much, if it's S-Corp, it's S-Corp pass-through line one ordinary income. If I'm a partnership, okay, a little bit different because now I have to take my partnership line one income, okay, I'm not impacted at all by guaranteed payments. So line one partnership income has guaranteed payments deducted out of it. So I would add guaranteed payments back in, but then I have other things to deduct. So partnership income plus guaranteed payments, now less health insurance for the, for the owner, self-employed health insurance, self-employed retirement plans, et cetera. So kind of a big deal to make the calculation. That's why we have computers today, but it's a good way to check it. Um, one of the small things that um, a lot of people missed in this law as well is Puerto Rico is included. So if I have operations, business operations, or a subsidiary operating in Puerto Rico, the net income from that subsidiary is also included in my QBI calculation. So that's the definition of QBI. Um, now, there are many elements to QBI and taking the deduction. One of the most confusing when it first came out was, what is a specified service trader business? What does this mean? Well, what it means is Congress basically said, if you have a trader business associated with one of the things you see here in front of you, you're a doctor, you're an attorney, you're a CPA, you do actuarial, um, you are a consulting. And the big thing on consulting is if your firm is in your name, you're a specified trader business. If your firm derives the bulk of its income from the skill of its, its owners or of its employees, you're in consulting. And that also means you're a specified trader business. Now it'd be tough for any of us to say, well, what business isn't that? Okay, a manufacturing business, the skill of my teammates is what helps me make those products and make them pro those products effectively. That's not what it's after. This is that pure consulting where you're trading on your intellectual capital and your knowledge of an industry. So those are the kinds of things. And what it means is, if you're a specified trader business, once you have, fit, once you have taxable income of over $426,600, once you have over $426,000, you will not get a qualified business income deduction, period. End of discussion. Between 426 and 326, you are phased out of getting some, but you will get some. And they set that up specifically. So if I am just an owner of a manufacturing business and I'm not one of those businesses, I get, I'm gonna get a qualified business income regardless of how much uh, deduction, regardless of how much money I make. So very important, that's our first thing when we start thinking about QBI and taking the deduction and making the calculations. We have to start with the definition, then we have to define are we, a, are we an SSTB or specialized service trader business. So um, the next thing is, so there's gonna be a lot of here. I've got like four or five slides on what is QBI, just, so just bear with us. What else is QBI? So proprietorships then can generate QBI. I may be a sole proprietorship that is an SSTB, okay? But I can still generate that QBI, S corps, partnerships, certain rental activities. This goes back to an early 2000s court case in which the IRS finally came out and said, Bill Cruzy, you own a public accounting firm. You also own the business, the building that your public accounting firm is in. I actually don't, but let's just say that. Um, they would, what they've determined then is that building activity where I am renting to my own business follows the character of the business that I'm in. Well, I'm in an ordinary trader business. Um, so, and I'm an SSTB, okay? So, but that's not a passive activity. That's an ordinary trader business activity. So the rental activity of me renting to my firm qualifies as QBI 
on a different calculation, but yet it does qualify as QP, QBI. Now, why am I making that uh, uh, an important aspect here? Because we have a lot of clients and friends who have multiple rental activities, okay? So they may have ver several Schedule E's or they may have a holding company that holds those rental activities. The important takeaway is some of those rental activities, especially ones where maybe I own a part of a business and the business rents a building from me, those are probably triple net leases, standard, standard triple net lease. The IRS in several court cases has kind of hinted at and makes the case here that a standard triple net lease is not section 162 trader business activity unless that triple net lease is the result of my business renting from my building. Now it is section 162 trader business. So that's important for us to think about. Now, what is not QBI? What cannot generate QBI? Really the only one on this list is corporations because qualified REIT dividends are QBI. It's just a separate calculation as is qualified PTP, separate calculation. But for the purposes of this discussion, when we look at a qualified business income deduction, those three things will not be calculated. So moving on. Here's some more what is QBI stuff. Um, so now what we're looking at is the definition or how do we figure out, how do I actually compute what qualified business income is? I know that if it's coming from an SSTB, um, I may be phased out. I know if I'm getting it from a corporation, I can't get it. But I also know that most other entities, so um, sole proprietorships, S corps, partnerships can generate QBI. Okay, so now how do they how do they generate it? So let's start at the beginning. Remember that line one, pass through income. Okay, so if I'm a partnership and I have pass through income, okay, I add back in my guaranteed payment because guaranteed payments even though the service has spent a lot of time trying to get partners and partnerships to put guaranteed payments on their tax returns, for purposes of QBI, guaranteed payment is not a reduction. So pass through income, add back, Q, add back guaranteed payments. Now, all those self-employment things we talked about, now I reduce it by self-employment health insurance and self-employed, um, the, the, the deductible portion of my self-employed tax, my self-employed, um, retirement income. I'm deducting it by those. Some of the misnomer things that we forget when we're trying to figure out what QBI is, um, is one of the things are if I have a partnership and I have unreimbursed partnership expenses, I have to deduct those against my calf calculation of QBI. If I have spent money or borrowed money to, and this is now investment interest expense, to acquire outside basis stock of some maybe my S Corp or new partnership interest of the existing partnership, and I also have interest expense associated with that, that also burdens QBI. And the last one, kind of surprising here because clearly the IRS has their cake and eat it too. QBI is burdened by section 1231 losses. So these are business activity or business divisions that maybe I've closed down and I'm taking what they call a section 1231 loss. So those are all part of the calculation of qualified business income. Um, what is not QBI? Well, believe it or not, you have to exclude from QBI if you have Section 1231 gain. So I've divested myself as a, of a subsidiary or division and I've made money on it. Can't use that as a part of QBI. So they got their cake and eat it too. I have to burden QBI by the loss of a 1231 but I don't get to pick 1231 gain up. So those two things on either side, just general capital gain. And, and the, the thought process here as you read through these are, these are truly portfolio in nature. These are investment activities, capital gain, portfolio income, trading income. You may be hedging um, legitimate, so if you're a farmer and you're hedging legitimate um, commodity trades. Well, that would be ordinary income. So that's not really considered trading income over here. That's part of your ordinary income because you are in the business of producing a crop. Most of the rest of us though, trading income is gonna be some sort of a capital investment. Reasonable compensation. This is towards your S Corp. An S Corp must pay its shareholder reasonable compensation. So reasonable compensation of the, of the owner burdens the QBI. Now, in this case, it's already out of line one of the S Corp 
income, okay? So we don't, add, we don't have to deduct it again, but it is something that doesn't help us with QBI. Here, guaranteed payments are on the other side. Um, it's already burdened out of line one. Well, I get to add them back in for purposes of determining qualified business income. And the last thing is annuity income. Once again, that should be up in that portfolio area where I've made an investment in something and it's paying me um, uh, an ongoing income stream. So we're going to stop just real quick. We're about uh, 15 minutes into it. Uh, Catherine, do we have any questions we need to address uh, before we go forward? Uh, no, it doesn't look like we have any questions right now. Um, okay. If you think of something that you'd like Bill to answer, you can either click on the question or answer, or you can click on my name and chat with me directly. Okay, terrific. All right, so now we're going to get started. We've, we've defined what is QBI. We've got SSTBs that we have to be aware of, so specified trader business. Um, we've got the entities that we know can spin off QBI. And now we've talked about, well, what is QBI itself? What is that income? What is the I part of it? What is the income? Now what we're getting into is when we start, the whole point of this is QBID, Qualified Business Income Deductions, the whole point of this whole talk. The things that we want to be aware of here are that um, the three different thresholds that will get us some form of a QBID. Obviously, if, our, if we're at threshold one, which is our, our taxable income is below 163,000 for single or 326,600 for married filing joint, we're gonna get the entire QBI, no limitations, okay? The second threshold is now between, we've got these phase ins, right, phase outs. For single, 163 and 213, and for married filing joint, 326 and 426. I've rounded both of those. So those are that's that center threshold. So I'm within the boundaries. Once I get over the thresholds, I'm over $213,600 taxable income of single. Now that's taxable income of single person. That is not, double scudder score is not the qualified business income. This is the, T, the taxable income on my 1040, okay? Because remember, the deduction is taken at the shareholder or the owner level not at the business level. And that's why it's very unique. Once again, an over 426.6 for married, married filing joint. The reason we have this high threshold is in that threshold two, we get some phase outs, okay? Where QBI times 20% is normally the max number. And as we get in the middle, we start phasing out how much of it can I, can I actually deduct. This is a very complex calculation. Once I get in, a, in the phase threshold three, if I'm an SSTB and I'm over threshold three, it doesn't matter. I am not getting QBI. I will not get a tax deduction for it whatsoever. Um, so check my notes real quick. Um, so that is the calculation thresholds and you're gonna need to know those. This, these are the kind of things, we gotta know these by memory. Where am I? When I'm helping my client and we're thinking about what's gonna happen in the next year or the next six or eight months for, from a planning perspective, these are the elements. This is the first stop on the, on the way to knowing what we should be doing next. So I thought the easiest thing to do is to put it in some sort of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that I can see visually and just understand it from that perspective. Um, so when, once we have determined what our entities are, that's the determined QBI entity, then we start beginning and say, and remember, got to go back to the individual. If my taxable income is below the threshold numbers, there's no limits on QBI um, for whether I'm an SSTB or not an SSTB. I get to take a tax deduction for 20% of my qualified business income. So if that 163,000 is all of my income, taxable income, then I get to take a tax deduction for 20% of that right off the bat. Okay, now it's deducted just so that we know. Whenever you get the qualified business income deduction, it is deducted from gross income. So it's before the calculation of taxable income. Obviously, it factors into it because I'm reducing my gross income before I get to the next stop, which is taxable income after itemized deductions and some other credits. So in 163,000, that's a $32,000 tax deduction at my tax bracket, you might be in the 15 to 20% tax bracket. Well, that's real money that's reducing my tax liability. 
Now the next part is these phases, right? 326 to 426, 163 to 213. When I'm in that kind of that no man's land, now I have to say, hey, if I'm an SSTB, a specified service, okay, then I'm gonna have a phase out, and it's very important, but I also have a phase out if I'm not an SSTB. So in the middle, we're all still, we're all still treated pretty much the same, okay? But there is a phase out, and the way the phase out works is, it starts calculating the percentage of where you are. So if my if my if I'm married filing joint and I'm halfway between 326 and 426, in essence, 50 percent of what I would have gotten is now reduced. So I'm reducing the ability to take that deduction. And that, in general, is the way that middle threshold works. Once I get in the high side, the over. Okay, um, we all want to be in the over, by the way, because um, you know, we, we all want to have a better tax return and, and um, do some more planning from there. But if we're over 426 or 213 and I'm an SSTB, nothing, zero. Okay. Um, if I am not an SSTB, now I'm limited. Instead of getting the 20% of QBI, now I'm going to be limited by a calculation based on the wages paid by the entity generating the QBI. So once again, it's deducted on my 1040 but it is 100% dependent um, from a calculation perspective on the factors that are also coming from the pass-through entity. So now I need, what did the pass-through entity's wages do? What, are, what is their qualified property? I'm gonna need to know those things when I'm over the threshold in order to make a calculation. Um, thankfully, once again, we have computers. So most of your K-1s, if you're getting a K-1 and it, and it uh, is, and there's an opportunity for QBI, it should have a secondary uh, statement that's given us, you know, the gross income has given us wages, et cetera. Um, that's so that we can use that information for calculating uh, the QBI. So those are our thresholds, good, good summary of our thresholds. Now, now we're going to talk a little bit about the calculation in general, and also what happens if I'm an S-Corp versus a partnership, um, whether or not I'm single or married, et cetera. So this is, this is kind of the first part of the summary um, conversation when we think about QBI. Once again, we've got our, our phase outs ranges here. You've got them right there, single, married, filing, joint. Um, but now we're talking about the calculation, okay? Um, I wanna read this first part though is, when we're serving um, whether or not we get the QBI, and let's say this is for brand new entity selection, we have to know budgeted revenue, we have to know our budgeted wages, we have to know the in net income, so those have to be real numbers. Um, so before it'd be like, okay, hey, I'm gonna start this new rental business, okay, we'll set up a, an LLC for you. What kind of rental is it gonna be? We need to start asking those questions. Are these triple nets? Or are they not triple nets? Because that's going to impact ultimate profitability and obviously the return on the capital being deployed to create the new entity. We also have to kind of go one more step now and ask, ask the, the relevant questions of, you know, well, what do you think you're going to do from a net income? Are you going to be employed? Are you going to have 401k plans? So that we know when we just get that federal ID number, which entity are we choosing? Now, today, we're pretty much always going to be an LLC. The question, though, is how is that LLC taxed? Well, if I'm getting QBI, it will never be taxed as a corporation. That does not mean that I will never have corporations. There are plenty of reasons to have a corporation, and many of them will outweigh whether or not um, I care about QBI. Um, it depends on uh, factors such as, well, I'm thinking about going public. Well, corporations are going to weigh heavily in that decision. Um, am I going to have a very, very sophisticated retirement, stock option plan, et cetera? Probably corporations will weigh heavily. I will tell you, though, with today's attorneys that we work with, very creative individuals able to take an LLC and really mimic a lot of the same um, attributes of that higher compensation options, restricted stock, et cetera. Now it's, it's option units, restricted stock units. So we still get there. But that doesn't mean that the corporation is going to go away anytime soon. But normally it's going to be an LLC, probably taxed as a partnership, a sole proprietorship, or an S corporation. So it's important to know those phase out ranges because they all fall down single and married filing joint. Now, how do I calculate it? 
If I'm at the bottom of the range, it's pretty much going to be QBI times 20%. If I'm in that middle range, this is where it gets a little wooly. Um, so I have a phase out percentage and you see right underneath there, the phase out equals, you can see it right here. I'm going to highlight right here. Phase out equals 100% minus taxable income minus the 326, which is my low end divided by 100,000. So um, right here, what I'm doing is I'm making a calculation of what percentage is my taxable income over the basement threshold level, 326 being for married filing joint. And so if I'm halfway there, then I'm going to get 50% of it phased out. And that's where it's important. Now, what am I phasing out? I'm phasing out the QBI times 20%. I'm not phasing out 50% of W-2 or any of that stuff. No, no, no. I'm phasing out how much of that QBI I get to deduct as, I, as my taxable income climbs up. Um, the last one is phased out completely. That's the top range for everything. And once again, when you're in that range, you aren't getting QBI times 20% at all. You're getting the greater of either 50% of W-2 or 25% of W-2 plus 2.5% of capital. Now that capital is, is um, the unadjusted basis of qualified property. And that does mean that you're gonna have to rerun some of your depreciation to figure out, well, what is that number? Uh, most of our tax, tax softwares are gonna be able to do that. But it's important to know that's a different calculation there on the phase out end. Um, once you're over, no SSTB. When you're in the middle, SSTBs and non-SSTBs are treated exactly the same. They get some piece of it, but they're not getting it all. So, Catherine, how are we doing on questions? Are there any questions just now? Right now, it does not look like we have okay. any further questions. All right, that's awesome. Okay, then, then uh, good news, gang. You may get out of here a little bit early, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> so now we've been through the thresholds, kind of beating that up a little bit. Let's go to the next one. Let's take an example. Under the threshold, so I am under the threshold, my taxable income, this is married filing joint, my taxable income is less than that 326,000. My taxable income is 300,000. I qualified business income and I have a wage or guaranteed payment of 125,000. Now the reason I'm doing that is, remember, line one, okay, has either if I'm an escort, my wage out of it, or if I'm a partnership, it has my guaranteed payment out of it, okay? And this is assuming that it'd be kind of a partnership because I've got a 99 percenter and a one percenter, okay? And you can kind of see me there on the, on the, in the next slide, you're gonna see me do away with partnership. It gets really complicated once we get into that middle threshold. So I'm an S Corp, I've got $100,000 of QBI. Now for an S Corp, remember, the wage is already out of my line one, 100,000. So that is QBI. Okay, so if I get a K-1, it's line one, 100,000. I don't have to back out the W-2. It's already out of there. Okay, so I start with 100,000. Remember, this is, the, this is the base. So the QBI is 20% of that qualified business income or 20,000 for an S-Corp. Now, the only other thing I compare it to is what is my taxable income? So the maximum I will ever get on a QBID or qualified business income deduction is 20% of taxable income. So I compare, it's the lesser of the two. Um, if, uh, if I'm an S Corp, 20,000 is QBID um, on the S Corp pass through and then gross QBID would be 60,000 on 20% of taxable income. It's the lesser of the two. So my QBID in this example is $20,000 for an S Corp. Okay, so now what if it's the exact same thing but I'm a sole proprietorship. In this case, the reason I'm adding back the guaranteed payment is because I'm a sole proprietorship. I don't take guaranteed payments and I don't have a W-2. So it's the same numbers though, okay? So net income um, without regard to my salary under both cases is 225,000. Under both cases, taxable income for the, for the, for the married filing joint is 300,000. So now how do I compute this? Well, I'm a sole proprietorship, so I start with QBI, which is now 225,000. Remember, no W-2, no guaranteed payment there. And so I get 20% of that number or $45,000. I still compare that to 20% of taxable income or $60,000. Big difference here, folks. So sole proprietorship, if I'm choosing my entity, 
and I'm saying, you know, I'm probably never going to make a half million bucks, but it's a pretty good gig and I like where I'm going. So proprietor is the way to go. Um, definitely the way to go if I'm at the threshold and below. Okay, 45,000 versus S-Corp. Partnership would be exactly the same. And remember, my partnership was 99% and a 1% owner. So it's the same calculation pretty much. Um, <clears throat> so that's the uh, under the threshold calculations. And right now, if I'm thinking of a business entity, I'm going to go with a sole proprietorship. I'm still going to go to the IRS website and get a federal ID number. And it's going to be an LLC, but it's going to be um, a single member LLC. So that is our entity choice for that. Whoops. Okay. Now we're going to get um, a little more crazy here. There's a few more notes here. Um, so here we are again. Now we're within the threshold. So we're between 326 and 426. We have taxable income of 385,000. Remember, keep going back to QBI and taxable income are more than likely two different things. QBI is what's coming from the pass-through. Taxable income is my personal tax return, okay? This is calculated ultimately and deducted on my personal tax return. So as an S-Corp, let's say that now my, my taxable income on my 1040 is 385,000. I've got the same example though as I had before. So I have now, I've got qualified business income of 100,000, guaranteed payment of wage of 125. So pretty much the same exact scenarios before, except now my taxable income is higher, which means that phase outs start coming in. And this is where it's really important to kind of stay with us here. So qualified business income is the lesser of QBI times 20%, that's your first line, and 50% of wages, except in this case, I'm pretty much ignoring the part that says it, there could be this capital thing for unadjusted basis, unadjusted uh, business capital. I'm taking that out of it. We're just gonna do the simplified approach. Um, so. Now, the way we compute this is that we are now at 385, where phase in percent is, we are 58.4% of what would have been our qualified business income deduction is gone if the factors don't hit us right, okay? So in this case, um, we are more than halfway over the finish line. Our QBI straight up is 20% of the qualified business income. Remember, S Corp. So keep the wage out of it, 100,000 times 20%, that would be 20,000, but I only get to keep 41.6% of the QBID on that calculation. I'm comparing that to the 50% of wages. Same kind of limitation, but you'll see here, in this case, because wages are so high and I get 50% of them and I'm not quite limited as I was before, that my wage factor is 26,000. Now this is a unique example and I probably should have made one a little, made a little more sense. Here's the way phase outs work. I compare the QBI phased out to the limitation of wages phased out. If the limitation of wages is less than the limitation on the QBI, so, in this case, let's say the limitation of wages is $7,000, okay? Then the overage would be 8320 minus $7,000 or $1,000, okay? I would reduce the 8320 by that $1,000 and my net QBI deduction would be 7320 In this case, the reason I'm doing this is really to make it really difficult and underscore the importance of understanding how your wage is hitting that S-Corp. Is your wage commensurate? Um, it's very important for us to know what that is. And this is a highlight of that. In this case, the wage is commensurate. And because the 50% of wages is actually higher, there is no phase out. I don't have to worry about phase outs in this case. So you know, I'm still comparing it to whether or not my total max is 20% of taxable income, which was 77,000. So now what would happen is my QBI deduction is still 8,320, okay? Now let's go back and tweak it just a little bit so, so that we, we all follow along. Let's say that when we do the phase, the 50% of wages, somehow the balance there comes down to $7,000, okay? So if I'm over the threshold, the 7,000 is my QBID. It's not compared to the 8320 or the 20% of QBI, okay? So that's really important. So 
let's say it's 7,000. So 7,000 is what it should be, which means that my QBI at 20% is $1,320 higher than it should be. I am 58% over it. So 58% of 1,320 is what I take off of that 8,320 to find out what my QBI is. If your head's not spinning now, it should be. I mean, it's just very complex and estimating this, you could definitely take too many corners and get a wrong number. So it's really important to go through these with a fine tooth comb, but that's your S Corp. Now, what you're gonna hear from a lot of people is, hey, in the threshold area, you probably wanna be a sole proprietorship or a partnership. What I'm showing here is it's just not, you just can't use any 100% rule of thumb. That's what a rule of thumb is. It's not 100%. A rule of thumb is, in general, this is probably what it is. In general, if I'm not burdened by commensurate wages or guaranteed payments, in general, a sole proprietorship or a partnership in the middle range might yield me a better QBID. What we're looking at here is it actually did not under this particular facts and circumstances. Same kind of math, it's a little bit different, okay? But what comes up here is the phase in calculation is starting to impact what happens with my overall deduction. So QBI at 20% is 18,720, I've limited it already. Um, the phase in calculation, however, says that of the 18,720, I'm 58.4% of the way there. So I have to limit my 18,720 by the 10,932. My net QBID is 7,788. In this example, a sole proprietorship or partnership is not better than an S Corp. So once again, that S Corp wage, very important to be calculating how it impacts um, our QBID. Obviously, we're not even touching on, I have to have an S Corp wage if I wanna get retirement plan out of my S Corp. We're not even talking about that right now. This is just very simple um, calculation on what QBID is. So I'm gonna keep moving on here. I don't see any questions popping up from you, Catherine, so I'll just keep uh, working through this because I know the math is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good, Bill. Thanks. So now we're going to do what I just told you you really shouldn't do. We're going to give you a rule of thumb. <laughs> okay. So it's, yeah, I want to start with um, a couple of things. So, and this is kind of some explanation. Originally, there were two ways to read the proposed regs from QBI. When you think about this, does it make sense that when Congress passed this, that they would want one entity choice over another to be burdened by this? That Sometimes an S Corp's a terrible entity choice and sometimes a partnership's a terrible entity. No, it makes any sense at all to me. And the way the original regs were, were read and when I read them when they first came out, it certainly looked to me like Congress was making it so that no matter which entity you were, the add backs and the subtractions got you to the same place. Final regs said, nope, that's not what we were after whatsoever. The final regs came out and said, you know, just like that, funny video that's going on about whether you want to be um, um, COVID quarantined with your family and they just immediately choose B. Uh, Congress went with B. I'm choosing B and that is we are going to have a negative impact because of your choice of entity. So now from a planning perspective, we have to think about whether or not the friction of maximizing QBID in the face of maybe needing to change our entity type is worth it but it is something that we'll need to look at, okay? Now, the funny thing here, or the interesting thing here is, the entire 199A regs, and I wanna double underscore this, have nothing to do with guaranteed payment. They, in fact, do not have specifically say guaranteed payments shall not burden the partnership or sole proprietor income. So it's kind of an interesting thing. They've spent so much time trying to get partnerships to say, what part of your, of your wage, what part of the money do you take out of there is really guaranteed and you're gonna get it whether the business is high or low. Um, and you could get it even if it throws the business into a loss. So they spent a lot of time on that, but um, for, for purposes of qualified business income, we don't take into account either the guaranteed payment or the reasonable, the, you know, we do take into account reasonable comp uh, compensation for an S Corp. But if we're equal to or less than, I can say with pretty good certainty that an LLC will always yield a higher QBID. So if, if my LLC is going to have less than um, 
my taxable income is going to be less than 426000 and my LLC is coming in there, I'm going to want to be an LLC. Will I want to be a partnership with a 1% owner, maybe my spouse um, or, or, you know, my partner? Yeah, I might do that. Um, we like it from an optics perspective to do uh, partnership returns uh, because we think it uh, takes the, the weight off the 1040. So optics is a thing. But you're always going to get a better number with QBID. Remember, rule of thumb. So I'm using the word always, which means I'm 80% right. So um, now, within the range, man, this is a big deal. This is pure facts and circumstances. Um, so an LLC with the same QBI, but a lower wage to QBI score will favor the LLC every time, okay? Because you're not burdened in that middle range if you don't have wages. Because remember, the wages limit the wages limit your QBI. So if my wages are lower as a percentage of QBI, favor the LLC. If my wages as a percentage of QBI are higher, not favor the S-Corp. So the other way to look at that is, well, a lot of times S-Corps tend to be more mature businesses, tend to not be startup businesses. So from that perspective, that S-Corporation is probably generating pretty good QBI and has uh, wages uh, outside of just the owner. So those things are going to impact me a lot more when I am in that middle range. They're going to cause more of a, of a phase out. Um, finally, if I'm greater, the big thing here is if you're greater than those thresholds, 426,600 or 213,300, if you're greater than those, no SSTB. Financial advisors, accountants, um, all the attorneys, nobody's getting that. Those, those people in SSTBs are not, the specified services are not getting it. Now, one of the things you want to look at is, is the service, you know, has had a couple of years to think about this. There's a few cases out there. And some places we look at certain industries that may have a doctor piece and a very high retail piece. You got to look at that too. So this is not an easy laydown how much of the retail is a result of the doctor. If it's not high enough, then it's just going to be commingled in with the doctor. But in this case, in some cases, if the piece that the doctor is, is a lower percentage of the business net income versus, you know, the, the some sort of ancillary service that they pre present for it, then you may be able to get a, uh, even though you're an SSTB on part of it, you may be able to get um, some QBID. Uh, LLC partnership, I just put them there because it really is a fact and circumstance. We have to be careful of a whole lot of things once I'm over this threshold of that 426,000. Um, so let's see, let me check my, my notes real quick. Yeah, I think the, the big thing is, I mean, I think we're still going to take out the same things. When we're thinking about our business entity and we're thinking about QBI, going back to what I said a little bit ago, we have to factor in whether or not I'm going to have a retirement account. I'm going to go ahead and go to this next. So we're going to kind of wrap up. This is kind of what I want to think about is entity budgeting. Okay. We have to think about where's our contractors coming in? Because remember those contractors are not W-2 and contractors, 1099 employees do not factor into QBI whatsoever. They are not a W-2. So I only have W-2s for W-2s. So it's important to know how that ratio is. Some businesses have a lot of 1099s um, construction they have a lot of 1099 uh, employees versus you know, a public accounting firm has more W-2 employees. So we want to factor that in there. We may want to, from um, a maximization of QBI, remember, here's the thought process. Um, this thing expires in 2025. Let's say I'm in a, um, a fixed asset heavy industry. Um, we may need to weigh whether or not we should opt out of that, the current depreciation method, methodology, which allows me to write off 100% of my fixed asset um, acquisitions. It's just, it's so right now, if I don't want to write off 100% of my fixed asset uh, purchases, I have to opt out of it. Whereas prior, we called that section 179. So really important, it's not section 179. The current depreciation standard is, that if I buy a piece of equipment, the chair I'm sitting in, I get to write off 100% of it. If I don't want to write off 100% of it, 
I opt out of that regime, but I have to opt out of it for the entire fixed asset purchases in that year. So it's, but it's a part of something that we want to think about when we're doing our budgeting and we're doing our, these, these elements of figuring out how where QBI comes in this year. Another thing to think about is it's time for us to talk about retirement. If I'm in an S corp, more difficult, obviously, um, if I'm a partnership, but if I'm an S corp and I want to have a Roth 401k, well, that's not going to burden uh, net income, is it? Because it's taxable. I'm front loading the tax on it. So that's a pretty good consideration to have maybe a good, strong Roth uh, retirement account, but it's still giving me some that the QBI is actually helping pay for that Roth a little bit. So those are some things to think about. Um, personal taxable income. Once again, going back to if you're, if you're on the beginning and you're thinking about, I've got a startup business, and I think I need to know whether or not I should be an S-Corp or sole prop or partnership, you really got to also make sure you understand the impact of the whole mechanism on your personal taxable income. Most of the time on a startup, you sacrifice something. So your personal taxable income in that first year may be coming down pretty significantly. So as we look at whether or not QBID is even a factor, we have to know what our capitalization is, how we're going to capitalize it, where our debt is, where the debt is, um, and also finally, what it's going to do with my ability to generate taxable income. So I may have some pretty substantial um, taxable income, but on a startup, because maybe I've got some severance package or coming, but my startup is actually losing money. How do I, re how do I reinvent that? So that's very important. The last thing is, is the juice worth the squeeze? It, does it make sense to spend too much time on QBI when we think it's, we know it's going to expire in 2025. If there's a change in, in our currently makeup in Congress, there's a decent chance um, that, it, that it's probably out of, out of whack in 2021. I think that's probably one of the first things they'll look at. So you want to think about it from that perspective. So um, do I need to change my entity? Um, we want to have to take in whether or not the expiration of QBI is going to have an impact on us. Because if I go through the mechanisms of changing entity and getting that other business entity out of one and into one that's more applicable to current taxation, um, if I'm asking QBID to pay for that, we want to be aware of that, that phase out period. So that, folks, is our last slide. Um, Catherine, any questions before we um, convene here? Nope, it doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for spending some time with us today. I know this was um, pretty complex math. Uh, this is definitely algebra for me. If you would like to have a copy of the slides, emails right there, office at hkglobal.com. You could also uh, message Catherine um, during the chat, and she will absolutely send you these slides. So um, I'll leave this, this uh, slide up for a little bit more, but otherwise, um, I'll stop my video. I want to thank everybody for coming and taking time with us today. Please don't hesitate to call us. If you want us to deep, div, you know, dive a little bit deeper into your business to see how it will help us here, let us know. We'd love to help you out. Thanks again.